Welcome to the uh, Oliva Gibbs Energy Education Series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about state versus tribal severance taxes, legal history, and recent cases. Uh, joining me today is Mr. Greg Harjo. He's a senior attorney in our Oklahoma City office. He's licensed in Oklahoma and is our resident Indian law specialist. Uh, my name is Chuck Lundeen. Uh, I'm a uh, senior counsel with Leba Gibbs. Uh, I've got over 40 years experience in the legal and land fields, a uh, title attorney, and also I've been VP of land and uh, general counsel for several oil and gas companies. And so I'm really excited to be with Leba Gibbs and uh, we've got a really good uh, agenda for you today. Uh, our law firm has offices in Oklahoma City, Houston, Columbus, and Lafayette, Louisiana. And uh, we've got over 35 attorneys and we're growing. We're licensed in 13 states and uh, we specialize in title, due diligence, acquisitions, divestitures, transactions, litigation, and regulatory work. And uh, we're adding to our workforce. So if you or anyone you know is an amazing lawyer, please pass along our name uh, and we're looking to fill uh, positions in each of our offices. Uh, to respect your time today, uh, our presentation is actually longer than an hour. So we're gonna cut it off at about an hour and do a second part. You will still get a full hour credit for Texas and Oklahoma CLE and also for AAPL credits and we've applied with a couple of other land organizations and waiting for their approval which we should have in the next week or so. So within the next week or so you should be getting a affidavit of attendance and your CLE and uh, AAPL credit forms. So uh, like I said this will be a pro probably a two-part series in respect to your time today so you won't miss uh, any time during your lunch hour. And uh, we'll just go ahead and, and start with Mr. Harjo. Uh, Greg, uh, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself real quick? Okay, uh, Chuck, I've um, been licensed to practice for over 20 years. And interestingly, uh, I actually worked for Chuck about 20 years ago indirectly. The firm I worked for represented the company that he worked for. So it's a, it's an honor and privilege to be back with you. Thank uh, you. After all these years. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about the state and tribal severance taxes there's quite a bit of uh okay let me let me just stop that real quick we're gonna fix our slides just one moment i apologize okay sorry for that um the severance tax code i've got the first slide up there this is the severance tax code of the muscogee creek nation and that's the the tribe that i'm a member of and um you'll see the basic severance tax code they have is similar to every other code that you'd see in the states or other tribes. And it's basically a 10% tax on oil and a 10% tax on gas. Um, and that's a little higher than the states. Our state here in Oklahoma is a 7% tax. And uh, so this discussion is going to be about jurisdiction and taxation issues. Who has the authority to assess that severance tax in those areas where there's dual jurisdiction? Um, so here in Oklahoma, we have five civilized tribes. And again, the tribe where I'm a member, Chuck, is the is the Muscogee Creek Nation. And it's uh, essentially right now, it's about 3.2 million acre reservation. But uh, and I'm going to jump in here real quick on this next slide for Greg, because he's got it, it really cleverly color coded on red and green. And the green, when you, you'll see these throughout the presentation, the green uh, lettering is uh, issues that affect the tribes or, or in support of the tribes and the red are state or federal uh, issues. And so it'll be kind of nice to be able to see as you're going through this, which ones affect which which entity. Right, and, and Chuck, this just basically sets, you know, the tone for the discussion. The tribes have a need to raise taxes with their severance taxes mm -hmm. and so do the states. And the states have that additional uh, interest of making sure their regulation authority is the same throughout the borders. Of course, that's going to be difficult to achieve given the nature of that. Now with recent court cases, nearly the entire eastern half of the state of Oklahoma is Indian country. Um, so I've highlighted one case here, the White Mountain Apache tribe versus Bracker, and that's a significant case that the tribes won. And the one right below it, I referenced cotton bean in Mexico, went the other way. That um, authorized state taxation on tribal lands. So we'll just get right into it. And if, if you're wondering, um, hey, Greg, you're making this up. Is it, a, is it that big of an issue? 
tribal severance taxes versus state severance taxes? Isn't that very maybe minute? Well, the Oklahoma Independent Petroleum Association doesn't think so. And in uh, and they're now the Petroleum Alliance. Now it's the Petroleum Alliance. Yeah. Oklahoma Petroleum Alliance. Right, Oklahoma. So in Royal versus Murphy, that was a Supreme Court case in criminal law case. It's a criminal law yeah. case. And and I'll get into the details of that. And you might think, as I did, why uh, would the Oklahoma Independent Petroleum Association be filing a brief in a criminal law case in Oklahoma? Well, it was, I, I'll tell you why, and it's again, back to these jurisdictional issues between states and tribes. So the essence of that case was uh, Murphy, Patrick Dwayne Murphy uh, committed murder in Henrietta, Oklahoma, which is McIntosh County. And he was sentenced and convicted to death. And that was in 99. Throughout the time since 99 to current, he uh, filed various petitions and uh, to the Supreme Court to get his conviction overturned on jurisdictional issues, mainly that the state of Oklahoma did not have authority to prosecute him, that only the federal government had authority to prosecute him under the Major Crimes Act. So that case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, well, first went to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, uh, did hold that only the federal government had authority to prosecute him. The case then went to the Supreme Court, and while it was pending, another case came through, uh, McGirt v. Oklahoma, and under the same issues. Um, I think a lot of people have heard of McGirt. It's been in the headlines a lot lately. We, we, we've all heard of McGirt, and it gets kind of the credit for this analysis that the Greek reservation is still in existence, covering 3.2 million acres. Um, but re in reality, it was, it was uh, Sharp versus Murphy that held that. It was the only reason the Sharp case didn't get decided first was Justice Gorsuch, who now on the Supreme Court, it was on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals um, while Murphy was being uh, litigated. And so when it went to the Supreme Court, he had to recuse himself. And so McGirt stepped ahead in line. Gotcha. So McGirt came forward with the holding uh, through the entire analysis that the Creek Reservation uh, had never been disestablished. And, and that being so, hence why the Oklahoma Independent Petroleum Association filed their brief with the concerns that if this reservation has not been established, then it's likely that the other five tribes' reservations have not been established under the same principles. Therefore, the entire eastern half of Oklahoma is still Indian country the term of art referring to the reservations of the tribes. So they file the brief. In their brief, they basically say the Tenth Circuit decision, and they're referring to the Murphy case now, will upend Oklahoma's unified statewide oil and gas regulatory regime, throw all economic activity in eastern Oklahoma, including the oil and gas industry in turmoil, resulting in overlapping and duplicative regulation and severe uncertainty. They further came out and said, just plain and simple, the Tenth Circuit, tenth circuit decision was wrong, just declared it wrong. Um, so I, I won't say that they were necessarily uh, wrong in, and I'm talking about the brief, that, that there won't be some jurisdictional issues. But since that case, I would say you would agree with me, we haven't noticed a lot of difference in oil and gas regulation in the state of Oklahoma. Um, other than Osage County, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission regulates all oil and gas activity in the state of Oklahoma. And really, we haven't seen any noticeable difference since that case. That doesn't mean there won't be some legislation or some possible litigation coming forward if the tribes pursue that. And in fact, they have pursued some. But uh, right now, we haven't seen uh, the nature of what they were claiming that it would just kind of cease all economic activity and, and just throw chaos. We haven't seen that occur yet. So this sharp <laughs> Murphy case filed uh, followed McGirt again, even though it was essentially before McGirt and the Supreme Court came forth with the same decision. Uh, just does it, didn't even make a, a decision just said for the same reason in McGirt, uh, of course. Um, McGirt versus Oklahoma on that next slide, I don't think, Right out of time, we might skip through that, but you'll have the facts of that case. It, it is essentially the same uh, fact pattern 
as Murphy, and again, holding that um, the Creek Nation had never been disestablished. And again, these, these cases were specific to the Creek Nation, but applicable to all the other five civilized tribes on Oklahoma. Okay, so again, with the, the brief of the, the, I talked about with the OIPA and their concern that the regulatory authority would be um, upended, the Corporation Commission. And this, and this is post-McGirt. This is post-McGirt here. Yeah, this, post is, this is post-McGirt. So now this is, this is at a time when, um, again, there's a little bit of uncertainty following McGirt and Murphy. And in a holding at the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, and it's just an ordinary spacing order that were spacing hearing application that was being heard, um, the authority and jurisdiction of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission was challenged. Um, under the following regret that uh, this is Indian land now, Indian country, and OCC didn't have authority over. So the OCC did issue a, an order in that case, and it was order number there, 715548, find that. And um, on that slide that you see there is their, is their holding on that. And they determined that they did still retain jurisdiction over Indian country, notwithstanding the recent decisions in McGirt and Murphy. Now, the, there was a, a couple of things I'd like to point out in their order. Um, I think it's totally fine for them to make a decision that they retain jurisdiction and they can um, elaborate on those uh, legal principles that they would use to retain their jurisdiction. However, if you read the order, it doesn't logically follow what they say. And the, the first red portion at the top of that page there, um, they misquote a statute, and that is 25 U, uh, USC 355 section 11. And it may not be entirely significant that they misquoted the statute, but it may be, and I'll explain those reasons. Well, there's not even a section 11, is there? There is no section 11. There is a, uh, the section number is 355. So, um, and then they misquote the statute, which again, may be insignificant, but I find that it's actually fairly significant that it may have uh, swayed their decision on whether they had jurisdiction or not. And the, and the quote there is where they say, all restricted lands of the five civilized tribes are hereby made subject to all oil and gas conservation laws of Oklahoma. And, and Chuck, that's just not true. That's just not what the statute says. And in fact, um, probably a lot of the, if there's some landmen and brokers listening to this podcast now, they would know that that statute is, is a descent and distribution statute. It refers to what's going to happen to the restricted lands of an, a deceased Indian whose lands are restricted. And it points out that that particular statute, we're going to allow the state of Oklahoma to probate their uh, estate, mm -hmm. to pass it on to their heirs. It, it, it nowhere close to um, authorizes Oklahoma to have oil and gas jurisdiction over there. It's well accepted that the Bureau of Indian Affairs through the Department of Interior has that authority. So if, again, if that was a simple typographical error or clerical error or just a misstatement of the way they really perceived it, then I think, okay, we, it might not be any significant event. But if their, if their reasoning was based on the belief that that statute existed, then it throws into question whether they actually do have jurisdiction. Um, so I quoted the actual test of the statute there, Chuck. You can see that I won't read it to you, but, but again, it doesn't say what they quote that it says. That holding, again, we're talking about the holding of the Corporation Commission now in reference to McGirt and Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, they say that the court determined its decision, that its decision did not extend beyond the application of the Major Crimes Act, is what MCA is. And again, that's just not true. Um, in Murphy and McGirt, the courts, and whether we're talking about Supreme Court or the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, went through great lengths and to a great legal history to determine that the Creek Reservation had never been disestablished. Now, it was, it was a close holding, so it's not that it's not questionable or not that reasonable minds can't re come to a different legal opinion, but nevertheless, the, the rule they found was that 
never been disestablished. So not with respect to any particular application, mm -hmm. just that it had never been disestablished. So whatever the application and the effect of that is, so be it. But the court for making the determination, it had not been disestablished. So I, I put in there in the green exactly what the Supreme Court did um, reference to and um, move forward to that next slide there. Um, just some basics here. Um, so you'll know the jurisdictional areas we're talking about um, in, in Oklahoma. In, in Oklahoma. Um, there, are, there are many treaties that, that we would be concerned if we were talking about every tribe in every state, but uh, in regards to the Creek Nation, an 1832 treaty set forth these reservations, which again, the, the, the west half of these have been ceded back to the United States, the east half would be still in existence uh, pursuant to the Murphy and, and McGurk cases. This, again, post-Civil War reservation, uh, reservation, so we'll talk about how this happened, again, why they ceded the West half, but these would be the current. Um, if you can see the names, it's the, the, the bottom blue would be Chickasaw, the Choctaws next to it in, in the lower corner, and then the Creek Nation there in purple right in the middle. Osage is the green reservation at the top and at the yellow in the upper right, that's Cherokee. Then we got Cheyenne and Arapaho also over there and the Kiowa, the Comanche down there. So the some way. of the smaller tribes also, you see probably have a hard time reading those names, but they're in there as well. Um, this map just shows that the current reservation uh, the five civilized tribes pursuant to the 1866 treaty. And these treaties that I'm mentioning here are all still valid treaties. So, um, again, a quick map of the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, being the fourth largest in the U.S., with about 90,000 citizens, covers 11 counties and including all of Tulsa County, which is why these Murphy and McGirt cases are so significant, obviously, in a major metropolitan area. Um, but you can see that jurisdiction of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission currently would cover that entire area there. So uh, here's some more basics, just uh, 534 recognized tribes, 39 in Oklahoma. I think Texas has three, New Mexico with 23. So Oklahoma is obviously um, the, the significant jurisdictional issue. Between states. What's the largest tribe in Oklahoma Creek? Uh, I believe it'd be Creek yeah, with 90,000. 90,000 citizens. Uh, so this statute is the New Mexico statute, and it relates to tribal cooperative governments. And it just goes to show you that these issues that we are talking about today have a light at the end of the tunnel. But when there, when there are jurisdictional issues and taxation issues between states and tribes, how can they be resolved? And I won't read to all the bullet points there, but you can see that, that one method is just for um, an allocation or a credit between the tribes and the states each give the taxpayer a credit mm -hmm. so that the end result is that taxpayer only pays 100% of the taxes due, not a double taxation of 200% due. And in that particular statute, the state is granting a 75% credit and the tribes grant a 25%. And this credit. happens to be New Mexico. That's, that's the state of New Mexico. And that applies, that's a gross receipts tax in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico does, doesn't have a sales tax, so that would apply to those receipts in, in New Mexico. So, but these type of agreements, um, we we often refer to them as compacts in Oklahoma. There's a gaming compact in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and it just helps uh, bring the tribes and the states together on issues where they might otherwise uh, be litigating in court. And hey, Greg, on this next slide, uh, <clears throat> is the definition of Indian country, and you told me that this is really just a term of art that it's really synonymous with reservation so yes it, it is it's indian country i think if you if you for, for laymen they might think it's just a generic term but it's actually a term of art and it has a legal meaning and it's defined in title 18 of, of our code um, interestingly this title 18 is a is a criminal code um, so you might think that its application of indian country the definition here isn't applicable to civil jurisdiction but it actually is, it's been accepted as the um, standard legal definition for cover all the entire reservation, as you can see there, it's not coded in green, as well as some other areas.
But uh, so when we discuss Indian country, we're talking about reservations and basically Indian land, tribal land, lands over which the tribes either have uh, jurisdiction or which they might claim jurisdiction. And so I think with the Creeks, there are trust lands and or with any other tribe in Oklahoma, there are trust lands over which but they have jurisdiction. And then there's these reservation fee lands, which they may or may not claim jurisdiction. <clears throat> and, and reservation fee lands, that might be a term that might not be familiar to everyone. But um, in the turn of the century from 1800 to 1900, there's the allotment period mm -hmm. where uh, the Indian reservations were allotted into specific tracts to tribal members. And over time, those allotments uh, became owned by non-Indians or non-tribal members. And so those are called fee lands within the reservation. They were lands within the reservation, but privately owned mm -hmm. by non-tribal members and non-Indians. And, and that's really the part where the jurisdiction gets uh, questionable, whether the tribes have the right to assess authority and regulatory regulated authority on on those reservation fee lands so in this next next slide the foundation of plenary power plenary is it full and complete i mean it's it's basically congress has full authority over the tribes is that what that means right over over the years uh the the concept of congress's plenary power over indians has has come to be just the standard um there's an argument that that plenary power isn't doesn't have a legal basis either in the constitution or the treaties or even the case law but nevertheless it's just become it's grown out of um, the indian commerce clause and if you haven't heard that term um, it's a, it's essentially the same as the interstate commerce clause meaning in the constitution the federal government retains the right to regulate interstate commerce between the states and they retain the right to regulate uh, commerce with the Indian tribes. And so the, through the Indian Commerce Clause, the power of Congress has gradually increased to what we now refer to as plenary power over the Indians. So some might say that with one stroke of the pen, Congress could come and eliminate the tribes tomorrow with just a declaration in a congressional act that the tribes would no longer exist. I think there's others that would say, no, they don't have that right because that would be contrary to the treaties that are still in existence. And the courts then are kind of the ones that try to sync those two ideas up and provide equity for both the states and the tribes. Um, Worcester versus Georgia. Uh, looks like looks like Worcester, but it's actually you know, Worcester, <laughs> at least by all the legal scholars. Um, but this was, the, the last of the, the Marshall Trilogy, um, which is the three cases that were very important in deciding uh, Indians' rights going forward. Um, but this is the first big case in support of the Indians. Right. The, the first two uh, in, the, in the Marshall Trilogy, as you would say, um, sided with the, the state's rights over tribal rights. And this one was the one that, now this was uh, dealt with the Cherokees before mm -hmm. removal to Oklahoma, so we're still talking about Georgia, but the Cherokee nation uh, was entirely within the state of Georgia. Uh, Worcester was a missionary that came down from Vermont to uh, provide missionary services with some others, and at that time, the, the state of Georgia had a statute that said, if you're going to go on uh, Cherokee nation, you have to have a license and you have to swear to an oath that you're going to protect the constitution of the state of Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. And that statute um, kind of came through federal uh, policy that had that same policy prior to that. But I think the state of Georgia just had that statute saying that um, we want to regulate everything within the state of Georgia, notwithstanding this tribe that exists within our boundaries. So, uh, Worcester went on the land without the license uh, and through his missionary services, he was arrested and convicted um, and sentenced to four years hard labor. Wow. That's a missionary, kind of a strange thing. Um, so his, his uh, conviction was appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court held uh, that the state of Georgia did not have authority over the, the Cherokee Nation, that it, um, it didn't come out and equate the Cherokee Nation 
with the state of Georgia, but it definitely uh, signified that going forward, the, the nation was going to have its own sovereign rights and ability to self-govern. So it was, a, it was a major case at the time, still is a major case. It's, it hasn't been overruled and it's still cited in, in cases today. Um, so the foundation of Indian country in Oklahoma uh, is known um, as the Indian Removal Act. That's the informal act, but the actual act, as you'll see there, an act uh, to provide for the exchange of land. So basically the- So you don't really agree with that title? Um, I, I think it was a forced exchange. Okay. It was a forced exchange, um, but nevertheless, um, an exchange, I think, um, that, but the, the key thing about that act is, is this section three there, which is just going to assure the tribe going forward that you're going to have these lands, you'll be able to self-govern, and we're not re removing or diminishing any of your sovereign rights. It's just, from, instead of on the east side of the Mississippi, you'll now be on the west side of the Mississippi. Gotcha. So that was the, 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 uh, the act going forward, and you'll see, I think on the next slide, we're talking about a treaty. Um, so the Treaty of 1832, this is just giving effect to that act. Um, you see, I've colored these in green and um, because I think, it, I think it's essential that the language that you'll see there, again, just, just <clears throat> guaranteeing the creeks the, to the right of the land, no state's going to pass laws, you know, no, no, no one's going to govern you, it's going to be your land. The, the, the bottom part of that paragraph though, mm -hmm. you see I left that in black and that's kind of the principle that gives Congress a way out here. And it, it says so far as, you know, Congress may think that you have to exercise over them. Mm -hmm. And that's a significant phrase there. Without it, I think the, the Creek's tribe uh, rights would be significantly greater. Mm -hmm. um, but again, going back to the plenary power, these, these little statements in the treaties, as well as the Indian Commerce Clause, just at this point, it's well accepted that Congress has plenary authority gotcha. until challenged. Gotcha. Uh, 1833 treaty is just uh, an, an addition, a sort of an amendment to the 1852. It Correction provided, treaty. It provided the yeah. boundaries. Yeah. It gave the boundaries. Of, I've actually tried to plot that out, and it's not easy to plot. Anyone who's run title, if they can plot that one out, I, I wish, you know, I'd like, but so the it's result. there, right? It's there, and it's but but it's not easy set but it's it sets the boundaries for the creek nation and um that was their lands moving forward from that point um in 1849 there you see the, the bia moves from the war department to the department of the interior and, and i code that as red because no longer are the tribes going to be treated as a foreign nation with, as a foreign nation, even though it's in the War Department and it may be slightly adverse to the tribes, I think their rights diminish once they become under the federal government and the federal paternalism begins to um, come forward. And so I think that was detrimental for the tribes at that point in time. Um, and then in 1852, the Creeks got their patents. And again, I've, I've researched to, to find that. It's a, I believe it's the Muscogee Creek Nation. Never actually seen it, but I do know that it exists. So those, those aren't filed in the county court? No, no, I think the probably the one, at least, there may be some copies, but I'm sure the one is at the Muscogee Creek Nation, but it would be that that patent that issued that large chunk of Oklahoma, central Oklahoma, would be about 6.4 million acres originally to, to the Creek Nation. Uh, Treaty of August 7th, 1856. Uh, and we're still talking about the Creeks. Still talking about the Creeks. Again, we can't uh, can't do without time. There's just not the time to talk about all the treaties for all the tribes. It would be hundreds and hundreds of hours. But again, these are just treaties that show the Creeks are still retaining their rights, still uh, have full authority to govern and self-govern and jurisdictional authority, et cetera. So, um, this is just coming on, and, and the next treaty is going to be a little different. And so we'll get to that one. This is the 1866 treaty, and the last one uh, that's uh, after 1871, there were no more treaties. So this is the last one, it's still valid. So the, the previous three and this one's still valid. And this one, the Creeks were required to cede the west half of their reservation um, in response to siding with the Confederate States during the Civil War. And uh, 
you might ask, uh, well, why did they decide with the Confederate States? And I think there's arguments for both reasons. One, they were from Georgia, so they typically had a closer tie to the Southern States than the Northern States. And two, when they were in Oklahoma during the times of the Civil War, I think a lot of the supplies and services were just cut off. And so they were left there in Oklahoma and uh, were confronted by the Confederate States who the Confederate States brought them a treaty in 1861 and they signed it. And they so they signed a treaty with the Confederate States. But if you look at that treaty, there's an indication that they believe the Confederate States were the successor to the United States. So um, regardless, in 1866, the last treaty, they ceded the west half of their reservation, retained the east half, and this is where we are today. And on the 3.2 million acres, uh, I believe you told me there was like a hundred or nine hundred seventy-five thousand dollars was paid for that. Right. So in that treaty, that's an important fact for the tribes. I think it it wasn't that the the United States government did not just take the lands; mm -hmm. they paid for them. They mm -hmm. paid nine hundred seventy thousand approximately for those 3.2 million acres. So I think that's good on both the the federal government and the tribes showing that there was a willingness there to, to an exchange uh, deal in this treaty. It wasn't just the federal government taking the lands. Again, was it a forced treaty? Probably, but nevertheless, it was a treaty. And I think it's that $970,000 in today's dollars is about 3.2 million or 32 million. 30 yeah, I think it'd be about 30, 30 a little million. over 30 million. A little over 30 million, yeah. For, for 900, so, yeah. So um, 1870, uh, so kind of switching tribes here and, and trying to focus more on, on the oil and gas side of this, um, Osage Nation purchased their land from the Cherokee Nation, 1.5 million acres still in existence. And the Osage Nation, which if you're not from Oklahoma, you may not be aware of this, retained all the mineral rights in, in that county. So through the allotment process, which is going to happen here in the 1900s as we move forward to these slides, um, Osage was the only tribe that retained all the mineral rights. So they still own all of those minerals and they still pay head rights to those uh, head right owners. And unfortunately for the tribe, there's probably a, a great percentage, I think it's maybe 25%, that are no longer uh, Osage tribes. In fact, there could be businesses or just non-tribal members at all that own those head rights. And you can see there'll be movies coming up about that that I kind of think explain that pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I won't get into the history of that, but but nevertheless, um, there is one thing that we'd like to talk about if we have time, and that's the fact that they pay a 5% uh, severance tax to the state of Oklahoma. And that's due to some legislation passed in 1906 mm -hmm. and also a recent act of 1940 that specifies specifically the federal government authorized the, uh, the state of Oklahoma to assess a severance tax on the Osage Nation. And what's significant about that is it doesn't apply to the five civilized tribes, it doesn't apply to any other tribe, it doesn't apply outside the state of Oklahoma, specifically to the Osage tribe. So they're really getting... Yeah, it seems, it there. seems to yeah. be extremely unfair uh, um, to them. However, there are some things that can be done about that. For instance, because they own all the minerals, they have the authority to assess a tax themselves. Um, currently, they are not assessing a tax themselves. So if you, if you have, no ex have experience leasing in Osage County, there are three royalty rates they can assess. So it's a one-eighth rate, a one-sixth rate, or a 20% rate. And so, um, what this gives them to do is on the say the 20% rate, for example, they could lower that rate to 12.5% mm -hmm. and so make up the difference with a severance tax that they assess. Mm -hmm. So they, that could balance out the lessee, the non-Indian lessee, he could still paying 20%, be paying a 12.5% royalty, a 7.5% uh, severance tax, so it comes out to 20%. Mm -hmm. So the lessee would not suffer any economic harm in that situation. And the benefit to the tribe would be the state of Oklahoma would not be able to tax their tax. Mm -hmm. They can only tax the production. So it would only be for taxing, taxing the production of 12.5%, not 20%. Now I suggested that 
to uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, HC in Osage, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Osage Agency, which regulates oil and gas leasing in for the tribe in, in Osage County. And I, I did not get a response. Um, it doesn't mean maybe they liked that idea, maybe they didn't like the idea, uh, maybe they didn't want me interfering. I don't know, but but nevertheless, it, it's a it's a suggestion, it's a possibility. Might it lead to litigation? Uh, it could, um, but I think that if you look, if we have time to go through these cases, whether it be in this segment or the next one, we'll see that other tribes in this situation are not paying a severance tax. So it's, it seems a little unfair that the, the Osage mm -hmm. is paying severance tax. Um, here in this uh, Appropriations Act basically said uh, no more treaties with the tribes. And again, that's that's a negative thing for the tribes because again, it takes away their status as a foreign nation. And again, it just puts them under this federal paternalism, which you'll see begins to develop. And um, the more authority under Congress, the less rights for jurisdictional purposes, taxing purposes. And again, these these red would be beneficial to the state because mm -hmm. if they're red, that means if the tribe doesn't have the rights, Congress did not reserve these rights in the Constitution. And as we know, any rights not reserved in Congress and the Constitution go to the states. Mm -hmm. So you really have three powers at work here, but the, again, the, the tribe and the states are kind of battling for jurisdiction and regu regulated authority in, in these areas. Um, so this is a 1885 statute. This is the Major Crimes Act here. And again, why are we discussing the Major Crimes Act? It's the beginning talking, of the Major Crimes Act. Right. Yeah. Why, are we, why are we doing this when we're talking about oil and gas regulation? And it goes back to what we talked about earlier about Indian country and that definition being accepted uh, for civil and regulated, regulated authority here. So but the Major Crimes Act basically says any of these major crimes committed in Indian country will the, the federal government retains exclusive jurisdiction over those areas. So um, this statute was uh, enacted in response to a case, Ex Parte Crow Dog, and that was where one Indian tribal member mur murdered another one. And uh, it was determined that the state did not have jurisdiction to prosecute them. So the, the federal government did not want the crime of murder being unpunished. And so they quickly established this act so that they would retain jurisdiction over that situation. And it's still, um, again, this this was the, the Murphy and and McGirt situation. This, this was it. This was the this was the act that where they determined no state authority. Um, so federal paternalism it's led up to this point and and um again this is these are just cases where no no jurisdiction is found you any any of these crimes where one indian uh, commits a crime on another indian on the reservation the states just don't have the authority mm -hmm. so those again those concepts being carried forward today um are beneficial to the tribe which has the right to maintain jurisdiction on reservation on indian country and um You'll see that even within a even within a particular holding, there's some parts that are in favor of the state, some parts that are in favor of the tribes. But but uh, these cases just keep going back and forth throughout time, really. Um, again, just more on the on this Kagama case. This, but again, these two cases, Kagama and Crow Dog, just uh, strengthening the tribal jurisdiction on reservation lands. Uh, Real quickly, um, or quickly as we can, uh, again, anybody who's ever run title in Oklahoma has run across this. It probably had to go research um, the DOS Commission records. When a lot of times you run a title in Oklahoma, you need to know who the original allottee is, what their role number was, in order to tr uh, trace down their heirs. But the DOS Act was enacted to uh, to uh, provide individual allotments of the reservation to the individual Indians, rather than one reservation as the entire lands. So uh, it ended up being extremely detrimental for the tribes, <clears throat> whether it was intended for a good purpose, and it very well could have, um, the, the result was devastating for the tribes. Um, in fact, the, the, <clears throat> the Creek Nation and 
the five civilized tribes initially rejected it, but uh, to me, the big five rejected the five were, civilized tribes. Right, and the and the Curtis Act later brought it under the authority of the of the five civilized tribes. Um, so the first Indian Mineral Leasing Act uh, that was 1891. Uh, this act is not a particularly relevant today. It's been modified twice. Uh, in 1924, 1938. Uh, so this, but this was the this was the first one for for informational purposes. It was the first one that started it. Um, we're getting to uh, a, a very difficult time for the tribes here. In uh, in March of 1901, essentially it was going to be the end of the tribes. It was the tribes were set to terminate, and um, with the allotment process. All the land would be allotted, the governments would be, cease to exist, and they'd be assimilated uh, into uh, the rest of the territory. Um, what we do know is that it didn't happen or we wouldn't be sitting here having this discussion today. Um, the next act, I think in, in the 19, so the, the act was set to terminate the tribes in 1906, and uh, in 1906, immediately right before uh, the termination that Congress acted to keep the keep the tribes alive, and that's just to they just wanted to <clears throat> honor the treaties they had made before, right? Now. Well, that and I think they ran into problems with the allotment process, mm -hmm. and it wasn't going to be as simple and as expeditious as what they had hoped. Now, what you have to remember is even though this uh, the tribes were going to survive in, through 1906, it, this, the intent was to still terminate the tribes at this point. It, it, but it never happened, and as we see, then the tribe slowly began to get some of the rights back. Yes, oh, sure. Um, we start going through some of these cases with the you know, we've talked a lot of background about uh, jurisdiction, um, and now we start getting into some cases that actually involve severance tax laws and how they were worked in Oklahoma. And one of the first cases was Indian Territory versus Oklahoma, and then Gillespie right behind it. And in both of those cases, at this point in time, and we're talking 1922 of Gillespie, that even at that time, the, the, the courts held that state taxation on those uh, Indian uh, leases, on the Indian le non-Indian lessees of Indian uh, minerals was uh, beyond the jurisdiction of the state courts. Um, under the theory, the theory was this intergovernmental immunity doctrine mm -hmm. means you can a tax upon a, even a non-Indian lessee is essentially a tax on that government, which the courts held that was uh, was beyond their authority. Well, these are all green. Yeah. They are very green. However, you see at the bottom it's red. Uh, Gillespie was subsequently overruled in 1938, so that particular holding there is is no longer valid. Um, this is the uh, next amendment to the 1891 Indian Mineral Leasing Act, and this is the 1924 Act, <clears throat> and it's still valid. Although it's been amended in 1938, there's some question and discussion of whether the 24 Act was repealed or whether, whether it is incorporated into the 1930 Act, 1938 Act. The, uh, the 24 Act has a uh, provision that authorizes state taxation. Um, the 1938 Act does not have a provision that authorizes taxation. So the question is, uh, in the 1938 Act, because it was silent on taxation, um, does the 1924 provision authorizing taxation, is it still valid or has it been repealed? And that's a question that I think is still argued today. Um, I will point out one thing about that statute <clears throat> is that the taxation only applies to executive order reservations. And there's a distinction between executive order reservations and treaty reservations. So, for instance, the Muscogee Creek Nation that we talked about, that's a treaty nation. It was created by treaty. All the five civilized tribes were and many others. Uh, however, for instance, the, the Hikaria Apache tribe in New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll have a case on them coming up, that's an executive order reservation. It means the president just signed an order creating the reservation. And so, it's interesting as to why this only applies to executive order reservations and not treaty uh, reservations. Um, there are some thoughts in, on that, but I, that I don't think we have time to discuss. But um, 
it, we will talk about it later when we talk about maybe the constitutionality of some of these statutes, mm -hmm. and that one may be uh, unconstitutional just on the grounds that it's it's not does not provide equal protection among executive order tribes as it would to the treaty tribes. So that argument's never been raised, but I think it might be one to consider in light of some new uh, case that are currently pending. Next slide. Uh, Indian Reorganization Act. Okay, well, this would be the end of the allotment period. So mm -hmm. we allotted lands from 1900 to 1934. And at this point, um, and all along, really, uh, the Congress and the courts and the tribes were well aware that the allotments just didn't work. So Congress enacted this Indian Reorganization Act, um, basically to try to remedy what the damage of the allotment process and, and going forward to try to, um, again, create self-sufficiency for the tribes, uh, providing their tribal governments, et cetera. So it originally didn't apply to Oklahoma? Yeah, so the Indian Welfare Act um, then was uh, enacted that brought that with under, oh, so was it? and this, this is the revision to the 1924 Act. Again, this act is silent on the state's authority to tax Indian minerals. Um, the 1924 Act, which we talked about, did authorize it. So, but which works? Um, and, uh, and the answer is uh, the 1924 Act is still codified with that taxing provision in the code. So if you look up the 25 USC 398, mm -hmm. it's, it's right there. The, however, uh, the courts have determined that it's possibly this act has overruled or not incorporated the 1924 provision which authorized tax. Gotcha. Nevertheless, Congress has never repealed it, so it remains part of the code. This is the case that overturned uh, the Gillespie case, and it's basically the first case that says the intergovernmental immunity doctrine is no longer valid. We're going to go with more of a balancing test, and so this case supports the proposition that states have authority to tax Indian minerals. So, again, entirely red there, you can see a, a very bad holding for the tribes, very good for the states. Uh, this is the act of, uh, in Cook of 1940 that authorized, specifically authorized um, the state to assess a severance tax, not just on the working interest of the Osage Nation, but on their mineral interest as well, which again, we talked about that earlier. It was a, it was a 1906 act that began it this is the amendment and the most recent and still valid act. Although this act has never been codified, so you won't see it in any federal regulation, which I should mention that Title 25, Section 226 governs uh, Osage Nation mineral leasing. The whole, the whole section is just Osage minerals. That's federal, federal regulations. This uh, act is not codified in the, the regulations. Have they challenged it in any way? It hasn't been challenged uh, recently. Uh, I think it is ripe for a challenge um, with the subsequent cases that have occurred since this act uh, was enacted. Um, I think it's due for a challenge on a number of reasons. One, even the uh, language of the statute. For instance, it's authorized the state to assess taxes, taxes on all the minerals in Osage County. Well, my first argument uh, would be, this isn't Osage County, this is Osage Nation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, there, but there are a lot of, again, the, the equal protection arguments, mm -hmm. why are we taxed when other tribes are not taxed? I, I think um, there's also other provisions in the statute that uh, say that the taxes have to be spent for a specific purpose, mm -hmm. bridges and roads and schools. So there's argument if that's not happening and there's, evidence that it hasn't, that the, the tax should no longer exist. And um, so I think I think it I think it is right for a challenge, um, but we'll we'll see. Well, and we've got about 10, 15 okay. minutes left here just to kind of okay. give everybody an idea where we are. Okay. So yeah, we haven't got the chance to talk too much about protection taxes. So again in our in our second uh, there's a case pending right now, Holland versus Brackeen. Mm -hmm. And it's an Indian child welfare case. In in that case, many of these issues which we are talking about are going to be relevant to the oil and gas regulation, not just oil and gas, but any jur jurisdictional issues in Indian country. Mm -hmm. 
So in that respect, if that case comes out and it could throw out Title 25, which Title 25 is the Indian uh, code, right? Mm -hmm. the title. So if, depending on the outcome of this case, maybe we just throw all this in the trash and start all up. So what we'll do in part two is just see what that holding is and then kind of get an on the ground analysis of how it affects jurisdictional issues. So um, this public law 280, um, and you'll see this again, this is a criminal jurisdictional statute, but its relevance is significant to civil jurisdiction. Um, in public law 280 of 1953, Congress said, if, if you want uh, criminal jurisdiction over the tribes, mm -hmm. you're welcome to have it. Um, I think the federal government had probably just been uh, overwhelmed with, with some of the jurisdictions, so they, they were willing to pass it on to the states. Uh, five states and Alaska um, accepted that criminal jurisdiction over the tribes. Subsequently, a number of other states did as well. Oklahoma did not. New Mexico did not. Um, and then subsequently, you'll see on the next slide, um, in 1968, that law was amended that, again, you could still accept criminal jurisdiction, but you had to do it with the tribe's um, permission. And, and obviously the tribes were not going to get permission with that. So uh, no tribes in 68 is given permission. So that, those states are the only ones that elect the federal public law today. Um, so 1970, Indian self-determination era begins. Um, you can see that um, up until that time, for instance, the, the Cretan nations weren't electing their own chief. Uh, it was being appointed. And so um, the, in the, in the, with the self-determination era, priests begin to have the rights to elect their own chief and begin to establish their own system of government again. And um, you'll see on the next slide a, a case that is uh, relevant to, to, to me personally, R. Jovi. Is that your father? I, I recognize him. Yeah, that, that was that was actually my dad. Yeah, he uh, he was part of this uh, movement for uh, Indian self determination. And at that time, as members of the Scoby Creek Nation, which we were, he recognized that the tribal council was being ignored by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so this was relevant for economic purposes because the chief at that time had the sole authority to basically make decisions regarding economic decisions of tribes, spending, and et cetera, and with or without the tribal council's approval. So according to the constitution of the Muscogee Creek Nation, it was a system of government much like the United States, an executive being the chief, legislative being the council, and then the the court system as well. So, uh, but at that time, uh, the federal government did not recognize the constitution of the Creek Nation, which was from 1867, and only recognized the tribe, the chief as the sole authority. And there was a possibility maybe for some bad acting between the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the chief. So uh, he sued the federal government, but be being the Secretary of the Interior and prevailed. And under that case, the court determined that the 1867 constitution was still valid and it's relevant to today you'll see this case cited in a lot of cases including these supreme court cases um, but similar today how we are determining that 1866 reservation is still valid at that time the court determined the 1867 constitution was still valid and so going forward from there the Council's rights were reinstated, and then they follow, followed it up with a, a new constitution that pretty much mirrored the 1867 constitution. So that case uh, is well known for establishing, uh, you know, self-sufficiency of the tribes and just reinstating that if their constitution had not terminated, which it never had, that it was still in existence and the government had to recognize. Okay, Greg, the next slide is the Indian Child Welfare Act. Now, after this slide, we're going to start into case law. Would this be a good slide to end on today? I, I, think, it, I hour. think it will. I think we'll just, uh, I'll just briefly touch on this and uh, and then save the rest for part okay. two. Um, because honestly, going forward with the pending case of Holland versus Brackeen, and I'm not sure if you're aware of it or who, who may be aware of that, but it's a, it's a major case challenging the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And if that case comes out against 
the Indian Child Welfare it's Act. It's being decided now. It's being decided now. It's been heard. It's at the Supreme Court, already been heard, and it's awaiting a decision. Um, the the constitutionality or the Congress's authority to to make law, make and pass laws affecting Indians, that is that essential um, authority is being challenged there, and and then with various other uh, challenges in that case. So I think it'd be a good place to stop there. Um, this Indian Child Welfare Act has been uh, in existence since 78, um, and it's worked well among the states, but currently, again, in this case, Holland versus Brackeen, you've got the state of Texas taking on about 26 other states of, of impose, wow. and about 500 tribes. So we have 500 tribes and about 26 states on one side mm -hmm. uh, that agree with ICWA and the support of ICWA, and then the state of Texas is saying that it's unconstitutional and they're challenging it. So it's gonna be a, I've, I've heard the oral arguments. Um, there's there's arguments on both sides. I, I'm interested to see it'll come out, um, but maybe when we come back, we'll uh, discuss Holland versus Brett Keene and its effect on on these issues that we talked about. Okay, today. well, thanks, Greg. Greg Harjo, uh, senior attorney with Oliva Gibbs, we really appreciate it. As I said before, uh, we will. This will be part one. We'll pick up part two. The interesting thing about part two of this series will be some of these decisions will probably be handed down and it could change a lot of some of these slides. So uh, stay tuned, and we'll give you a date on that. <clears throat> At the end of this month, we're going to have a. Well, each month we do an Oliva Gibbs educational series, and at the end of this month, we we're going to have a women in energy. It's a panel discussion with some uh, high-ranking uh, lady landmen and executives and so it'll be really interesting so you'll get notice about that and again you'll get the slide presentation and the the CLE and, and, and your credit information later on this week or next week so again we appreciate you thank you for viewing us and uh, give us a call if you have any questions thank you thank you